What is up, all my classics friends? Coming to you on a Sunday afternoon. It's around about 2 o'clock. Um, and today we're going to be talking about Euripides and the Bacchae. Um, and we're going to get right into it. Um, there's, I don't have any new things to announce to you. Just keep reading and uh, stay on with the syllabus and everything will be okay. Um, okay, so let's talk about Euripides. If you remember the last lecture, we talked about Aristophanes, the one before that, we talked about Sophocles, the one before that, we talked about um, Aeschylus. So today we're doing Euripides. Uh, his dates are that he was born probably in 485 and dies probably, well, we're actually kind of more certain about his death date than we are his birth date, dies in 406. So if you were paying attention, you'll note that his dates overlap pretty neatly uh, with those of Sophocles, who was born in 496 and died in 406. Um, Euripides died, uh, according to the story uh, I've mentioned to you many times about how reliable uh, these stories are as they come down to us, uh, which is to say not very, uh, but uh, uh According to the story, Euripides died earlier in 406 than uh, Sophocles died. Remember, the Athenian calendar runs uh, July to June, so it, there, it's a different uh, calendar. And so sometimes it's kind of hard to work out these things, you know, to, as to dating these things. In any case, it doesn't matter for us. According to the story, when Euripides died, he died before the uh, city Dionysia festival. And when Sophocles uh, put on his performances that year, which were to prove to be his last, at least for the, while he was alive, um, he dressed his chorus in black, i.e. in mourning. M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning. Uh, in honor of Euripides, which is quite remarkable when you um, uh, take into consideration uh, the radical difference between the approach to tragedy in Euripides' drama and in Sophocles' drama, as well as probably, I would imagine, I would guess, I don't know for sure, nobody knows for sure, uh, but probably they're radical, radically different outlooks on life, um, for that matter. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the back eight. So when when we when I discussed the Oedipus, Oedipus the King, uh, one uh, key thing that I gave you, one kind of um, hint to reading, was understanding it through Apollo. So you when you approach one approach, it's not like I said before in the earlier video. I'll say it again now. It's not the only approach, but. Um, one approach to uh, understanding ancient tragedy is to read it through who the defining divin divinity of the play is, because they all have one, uh, at least one. Some of them have two but or three, uh, but they all have at least one. And if you understand what the gods represent, then you can understand the larger thematics of the play. So to understand the Bacchae, we have to talk about Dionysus. Now, I've already talked a little bit about Dionysus with you uh, when we did the background of tragedy um, and what he represents as a god. So, first of all, he has he's called by different names, right? In Euripides' text, the two most commonly used names uh, or, or other names for Dionysus are Bacchus and Bromius. I'll come back to what these mean uh, in just a second. Um, so, but first I want to talk a little bit about what Dionysus is associated with. Um, again, we've already talked about this, um, so I'm just going to review this uh, uh, quickly. 
uh, certainly his primary or his nowadays his best known association is with wine. Um, he's also associated with uh, certain aspects of fertility. Um, and again, uh, this is I keep saying this over and over again, but this is repetition for you because uh, I already talked about this once, but uh, all the Greek gods are are fertility gods in one respect or another. That's part of the uh, point of being a god. Um, and, but there are different aspects of fertility that we encounter uh, in our daily human lives. And what Dionysus tends to represent is wild nature, uh, uh, spontaneous growth of nature, as opposed to the cultivation of crops. Um, which is more Demeter's uh, sort of thing. Um, so, yeah, uh, so spontaneous wild nature, uh, also associated, of course, with illusion. This goes closely hand in hand with his role as the god of wine. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, <laughs> Uh, when you get old enough to drink some wine, you'll understand uh, the link between alcohol and illusion. Uh, so as such, as the god of illusion, he's also associated uh, with theater. Uh, because theater is uh, in the ex uh, extended illusion. Um, we, you have to pretend that what you're watching on stage is um, real, even though you know it's not real, uh, as, it, as it happens. Um, and so you, you're willingly entering into this realm of illusion. Um, uh, and so you're wi willingly entering into the um, space of Dionysus, so to speak. Remember, these plays are performed in the theater of Dionysus at a festival of Dionysus. So uh, his presence uh, is already there, um, never mind uh, the fact that in this particular play, he happens to be one of the principal characters. So let's get into the play itself and talk about the play. Put this aside for a moment. I'm sure I'll need that again at some stage. Um, let's talk a little bit, first of all, about the backstory to the myth of Dionysus. Um, Dionysus is the son of Zeus and a mortal woman by the name of Semele. Uh, who is actually mentioned quite frequently over the course of the play. And uh, um, he, there's no, uh, there's no, so there's no sort of like genetic pattern to figuring out uh, when gods have offspring, whether they're going to be mortal or whether they're going to be immortal. Sometimes the kids are human. Um, and like, for example, Helen is human. Uh, and then sometimes the kids are immortal, uh, and sometimes the kids are human and then made into immortals, um, such as uh, Heracles, for example. Dionysus is fully a god upon his birth. Uh, but he has to be hidden away um, because uh, Hera, Zeus's wife, would be jealous if she knew there was a child. So he has to be given a chance to grow up in hiding. And so he is, uh, he's, uh, Zeus puts him down um, on, out uh, east of the Greek speaking world. So for our purposes, what that means is uh, it's Asia Minor, so it's modern day Turkey um, in, in, in uh, Syria, that kind of region. Um, it's not actually specified, uh, as far as I know, in any of the specific myths, but it could be. I don't know. I'm going to go back and look at the sources and see. Um, and uh, so he grows up there, and then he makes his way from there uh, back to the Greek-speaking world, uh, or back to, I should say, mainland Greece. But when he gets there, nobody nobody's heard of him. Nobody knows that he's a god. Uh, and so he has to establish his worship, and that's the basically what the plot of the back A is about. Um, so let me come back here for a moment. Uh, it's called the back A because the chorus are uh, followers of Bacchus, right? So the back A is feminine plural 
uh, for uh, worshippers, devotees of, of the god Bacchus. Um, yeah. Um, and so they themselves are also from Asia Minor. So they're not, they're also non Greek speaking or are filtered as being non, primarily non Greek speaking. So let's remember in our cultural context here that the fundamental definition of Greekness is that Greek is your first language. Um, and uh, so it doesn't, ge geography, uh, you know, skin color, what we nowadays filter as ethnic, ethnic, bah, 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 bah. ethnicity, that's not the primary uh, um, judgment um, uh, uh, paradigm. The primary judgment paradigm is, did you learn Greek first? Is that your first language? And if the answer is yes, then you are a real Greek. You are truly Greek. Um, so... When, the, when, when Dionysus and his followers come to Thebes at the start of this play, they're already looked at with a great deal of suspicion because everyone knows they come from somewhere else. Everyone knows that they come from a, a non-Greek speaking place. So they are foreigners. Um, I'll come back to this idea of foreign in just a moment. Uh, let me think about where I want to write this on the page. I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, uh, so, but what happened when um, uh, Semele was pregnant with Dionysus was that Hera, uh, in her jealousy, went to Semele and said, well, you know, Zeus doesn't really love you. I mean, if he really loved you, he would show you himself in his true form. And uh, so Semele acts on uh, her counter jealousy and asks Zeus to reveal himself in his true form to her. Of course, Zeus's true form is the lightning bolt. So she's burned to a crisp um, immediately. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah, uh, that happened. Uh, but Zeus rescues the baby. Now, here's where we get into the interesting part of the text, because as Dionysus comes back, Dionysus is coming back to Thebes. Not, he's coming back to Thebes to reintroduce himself, um, or not reintroduce himself, I should say, to introduce himself as uh, the god that he is, right? Okay, so let's think about this just for a moment here, okay? So we got, we all go to the theater, right? We all go off to see this play. And when we go off to see this play, what we do is we're entering into this space, this space is a space where we accept that we know, that what we know is not real. We're going to pretend like it is real for the time that we watch it, right? And then as we're watching the space, as we've already agreed that we're going to pretend that what is not real is real, we have our first main character, uh, Dionysus. But when Dionysus shows up, he doesn't come on as Dionysus. He comes on and he tells us uh, that he's going to be in disguise, and that he's going in disguise as uh, one of his own priests, basically. So he's appearing as Dionysus is appearing in disguise as a priest of Dionysus within the play, uh, because this is going to help facilitate his uh, revenge. So we start off with the realm of illusion. We enter into the realm of illusion. So we're already there. And then after that, we agree to accept that one of the characters within the realm of illusion is also then inside of the illusion going to be also playing an illusory character, going to be going to be playing a role. Um, which gives me a good chance to introduce another Greek word to you, which I know you are all so stoked about because I know that you love learning your Greek vocabulary. Um, it'll suit you well when you start studying Greek. Um, this is, the Greek word here is character, right? So this is, uh, uh, we get our English word character from this, but uh, the meaning of the Greek word character, the primary meaning and fundamental meaning of the Greek word character is the actual mask that the actors wear. Um, it's this, the, the Romans have a word called persona, uh, it means the same thing. It's an actor's mask. Uh, so your character is the role that you're playing. 
Uh, and what Dionysus tells us is that he's going to be playing the character of one of his own priests. Uh, so he comes back, comes back to Thebes uh, to confront uh, the king Pentheus. I'm going to put Pentheus's name up here. Oh, wait, where's Dionysus? I'll put him on the same sheet as Dionysus. Now, Pantheus is the king of Thebes at this particular point in time. By the way, some of you will have noticed that this play also takes... Sorry, I'll leave it up for a second. Pantheus, right? It's in your book. You can look it up. Um, uh, you, some of you will have noticed that this play also takes place in Thebes, just as Oedipus the king does. Uh, in terms of the chronology of the development of the myth, this is some generations before uh, when Oedipus is born. So this is actually just in terms of like, you know, like I said, the chronology of the myth, uh, this is, this is happens temporarily before, uh, the, the play Oedipus the King. It doesn't matter all that much. Uh, um, the, the two plays are not, um, uh, tangentially related except in so far as you will see that in this family, and this is certainly not the only family in Greek myth that has this, uh, propensity is that there's a there's a tendency towards violence within the family unit itself. Um, so yeah, if you read the Bacchae, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So Pentheus is the new king, right? But he's young, um, and uh, as such, he is uh, in some in in many respects uh, uh, very. He's very insecure in his rulership. Uh, and the way that you can tell about his insecurity in the rulership is how much he tends towards um, uh, tyrannical modes of behavior. His law is the only law. What he says goes, and anybody who violates it is subject to the penalty of death. Right? So he's like, uh, I, 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 I often, I hope this doesn't offend anybody. I'm, quite sure probably will, uh, but I often refer to uh, Pentheus as a young Republican uh, in the sense that he's like, uh, he's like that, uh, you know, uh, college, uh, you know, uh, sophomore, junior who wears a tie and brings a briefcase to campus every day and, you know, votes Republican and, and argues that uh, uh, socialism is the destruction of the fabric of, of uh, U.S. culture, that kind of thing. So he's like really super conservative. Um, and why is that? I think that is because he, again, I, I mentioned this just a second ago, I'll say it again. I think it has to do with just his kind of like general insecurity about his own authority, right? His granddad was the king, Cadmus. We meet Cadmus in the course of the play. I'll talk about him in just a moment. Um, and, uh, but Cadmus has decided to take his early retirement uh, from his kingship. Um, and he doesn't have any sons, he only has daughters. So uh, the, uh, the monarchy, the kingship passes to his grandson, Pentheus, who is a young man. We should think of him probably being somewhere around 18, 19, or 20 years old. In other words, he's only just come into his full adulthood. He's only just come into his full manhood. So I think all of those things play into his uh, general sense of uh, anxiety as, as king, as leader. Um, um, so we'll talk about Pentheus and Dionysus and their interaction in just a second. But before we do that, I want to get on a little bit to um, Cadmus and Pentheus, or Cadmus and Tiresias. Now, I, we we talked about, or we at least came across, encountered Tiresias in Oedipus the King, and I said in that lecture that I was going to come back and talk about him, and I'll do that now. Tiresias is an interesting character. So we've got Cadmus and Tiresias. Cadmus is the uh, former king of Thebes, now retired, I guess is what we'd call it. And then we have Tiresias. Tiresias, of course, is the prophetess of Apollo. 
He is here as he always is when he crops up in Greek myth. So he's prophetess, but he's old and blind. So both Cab both Cadmus and Tiresias are old. That's kind of their their defining characteristic uh, when they come on stage. Uh, Cadmus, like I said already, uh, was had been king of Thebes. In fact, he founded Thebes. He's the founding hero of uh, the city of Thebes. But uh, uh, like I said, now apparently he's decided to take his early retirement and hand the kingdom over to his grandson Pentheus. Tiresias um, is the old and blind prophetess of uh, Apollo. Uh, he wasn't always old and blind. There are myths that surround Tiresias. Um, I'm actually not going to tell them right now because we're going to come across him later uh, in uh, some of the things that we read down the road. And I like want to keep a few things in the bag to talk about later on down the road. Uh, but again, he's, he's prophete, so he's the oracle of Apollo. When Cadmus and Tiresias come on stage, they're both old men, and they get into an argument with Pentheos. Um, you'll remember I talked about the argument scenes in Greek drama. It's called the Agon scenes. Uh, I talked about it uh, in Oedipus the King. We, uh, just as in Oedipus the King, we will encounter uh, more than a few of them in, in the back A. But the first, the first Agon scene we have is between Cadmus and Tiresias, the two old men on the one hand, and Pentheus, the young, uh, powerful, newly minted king on the other hand. Um, and they do uh, what Greeks do in argument. They throw insults back and forth at each other. Uh, Cadmus and Tiresias, you're young and stupid. Uh, uh, Pentheus to Cadmus and Tiresias, you're old and blind and you can't see and you're fools. No, you're the fool. We're wise because we worship the god. No, you're foolish because this god isn't really a god. So you're being fooled. And, and uh, this, so they go back and forth uh, with each other. But what I'm getting at here, what I want to get at here is that there is a, there is a, 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 a kind of a transformation of Cadmus and Tiresias insofar that they are old men, uh, but they act like young men, right? So they're, they're dressed in the uh, traditional um, worship uh, um, uh, outfit, garb, clothes, uh, that you would put on to uh, go to a festival of Dionysus. And what that entails is that they're wearing an animal skin. Or if, in this instance, it's a young deer, so it's a fawn skin. And they're carrying with them a... Uh, ceremonial staff, a ceremonial rod uh, that you uh, carried about with you when you went in procession to or went to a festival of Dionysus. That thing is called uh, uh, a thyrsus. So they're wearing they're wearing the fawn skin, and they're carrying the thyrsus. Okay. So the fawn skin, what the what wearing the the, the deer skin represents is a link back to um, Dionysus's association with wild fertility, with wild nature. You only get a, a fawn skin uh, by hunting, hunting a deer down. Um, and so it, it, it's, it involves you being out uh, in wild nature and, uh, you know, interacting um, with, the, with the, the wilderness and, and with what it is alive. So let me come back now to this thing that they're carrying, the thyrsus. I mentioned a second ago that it, it's like a wand. Uh, so it's about, I would guess, probably about two and a half or three feet in length. The, the, the staff itself is uh, made out of fennel, fennel stock. So fennel is like a reedy plant. It's um, kind of sort of like bamboo. Um, in the sense that um, when you dry it, it's, you know, stringy and uh, it's still flexible, um, but also hard like wood at the same time. Um, so it's a fennel stalk, and then at the top of the fennel stalk, you decorate it. You put on it a crown, or to use the technical tome, a corona.
and then you also around it entwine stems of ivy leaves. So this is a thyrsus. This is kind of roughly what it looks like. Um, like I said, it's normally about two, two to three feet in length. Um, uh, and you uh, carry it as you do your, uh, your, your ritual chants and your ritual marches uh, in the procession to Dionysus. So what is this, what is this representative of? Why, why is this a symbol? Well, you got, sorry, I'm not, okay, let me look at the, so you got this part here, right? The, the, the stalk, right? This is fennel. So this is a dead plant that's been dried and cured for this particular purpose. But then all of a sudden this dead plant seems to burst into spontaneous life at the end of it in this, in this crown of ivy leaves at the top. So, so what you have is a, 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 a kind of a paradox here um, between the ideas of degeneration and rejuvenation. Don't worry, I'm gonna hold this up later. So there's a, a, a dichotomy. So what the thesis represents is that what is old is renewed back to um, fertility through the worship of Dionysus. Uh, and this comes out because uh, Cadmus and Pentheus, after the argument with, or, I'm sorry, Cadmus and Tiresias, after the argument with Pentheus, uh, say, um, okay, well, we're going up to join the worship. Um, and Cadmus says, let's take the royal chariot up the mountain. And Tiresias says, no, I feel like I'm young again. You know, I feel like I'm a teenager again. So let's, let's, let's walk up. Let's dance up the hill. Um, and so the, the I, I'm sorry, I'm thinking of a joke right now. Um, I won't tell it. Uh, the the uh, 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 so the the two old men, uh, having been rejuvenated under their 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 uh, worship of Dionysus, are made young again. Uh, okay, uh, but that doesn't for Pentheus. That's not that doesn't that doesn't end the argument here, because Pentheus has heard that the, this these new this new group of worshippers of Dionysus are led by a particular priest. Um, and, and so what Pentheus thinks, now this is what he thinks is going on. He thinks that he's heard that these women, because the back air are all women, right? So they're women out of Asia, so they're non-Greek, and they're female. Oops. Put that on the wrong side of the page. So, sorry, let's let the siren go by here. So what Pentheus expresses are, are basically um, a catalog of uh, um, very, very kind of traditional, conservative, um, specifically Athenian, but also I would say larger Greek, um, uh, points of view, um, uh, in so far as uh, uh, as relates to uh, what they thought of men and women, what they thought of Greeks and non-Greeks. Um, so Pentheus thinks that because all of these worshippers of, Di are, are, of Dionysus are going out to follow him, and because Dionysus brings with him wine, the logical conclusion is that all of these women are getting drunk and having orgies uh, because the uh, traditional um, uh, idea here is that men um, possess self-control, whereas women possess no self-control. But you can't let women out on their own. 
because if you do, they're going to get up to all kinds of no good things. Um, and that's a, 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 it's just a recurrent theme. Throughout Greek life. Um, uh, so what Pentheus decides is that he's going to go out and arrest this priest. Um, if he arrests the priest, then he'll be able to put a stop to uh, all of his followers worshiping him. So he does. He goes out and he arrests the priest, brings him back to the city. So then we get another Agon scene. This time it's between Pentheus and Dionysus himself. But remember, it's Dionysus in disguise as a priest. So I'm going to come back here to this graph for a minute. Remember, we're, what we're doing here is we're looking at the layers of illusion within the play. We walk into the theater, we're walking into a state of illusion. Then we accept that Dionysus himself is dressing up as another character um, within the context of the play itself. And then on top of that, what we get are two different explanations for Dionysus' birth. We get uh, Tiresias offers one explanation um, where he says that, uh, um, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, don't, don't worry about uh, Dionysus because uh, he's, um, the story about him being a god, because what really happened was when he was born, it wasn't, he, he, Zeus sowed Dionysus into his thigh. And that, and he, and he, and he, and he uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let me back up for a second. So the two different explanations for the birth of Dionysus. One is offered by Cadmus, one is offered by the chorus. The chorus talks about how um, when Semele was blasted by the lightning, Zeus took the unborn fetus of Dionysus and sewed it into his thigh. Um, and his thigh became uh, uh, what they call, what they refer to as his male womb. Okay, it's myth. All right, don't don't overthink it too much. Um, uh, but Cadmus, or I'm sorry, Tiresias, when he comes on, he says, no, 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 that's not really the story. That's based on a linguistic under misunderstanding. What Zeus did was he showed Hera a fake baby. And then he put the he put the fake baby down. He put the real baby down in Asia Minor, where it was raised by uh, the the women who will form the chorus, the back A. Um, so two different explanations. So we got another. That's another layer of illusion when you think about it, because who's telling the truth? Who has the real story? On the one hand, the chorus seems like they should be trusted because they are genuine devotees of Dionysus. Uh, on the other hand, Tiresias seems like he should be trusted because, again, he's a prophetess, so he is supposed to be taken as a truth teller, right? But again, it's, you can't, there's no, Euripides doesn't come down on one side or the other. He just presents, he has the chorus say one thing, he has Tiresias say another thing, and he just kind of leaves it out there. Um, so that's another level of misdirection, another level of illusion that goes on here. And then you add into that mix, of course, Cadmus. Cadmus basically says to Pentheus, well, who cares anyway, whether he's a god or he's not a god, because it looks good for the family if people think there is a god in the family. So just, you know, he calls it, what does he call it? A, um, a divine fiction is what he calls it, a divine lie. So whether or not he is genuinely a god isn't the point. The point is that what does it mean for the status of the family? What does it mean for their uh, uh, royal pedigree? Well, it means a lot if people think that they have an actual uh, uh, divinity within the family. So Cadmus's advice to Pentheus is just go, just go along with it anyway. Like it doesn't, you know, it's good for the family. Okay. So yeah. Uh, there's all these uh, sorts of like, uh, kind of like, whoa, what's happening here? What's the what's the truth? What's the real story? Okay, so let me get back to uh, 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 Dionysus and Pentheus for a moment and their agon scene. When Pentheus succeeds, sorry, let me get some more water. Actually, I'm going to refill my glass. Hold on a second.
I didn't go far, I promise you. Um, <clears throat> when when uh, Pentheus finally confronts Dionysus, it's a very uh, fascinating dynamic um, in the sense that uh, you can see that Pentheus is very clearly bothered by Dionysus. Um, what is he bothered by? Well, first and foremost, he's bothered simply by Dionysus's appearance. Why is he bothered by Dionysus' appearance? Because Dionysus is supposed to be a man, but he doesn't actually look like a man's man. As Pentheus says to him, I can see that you don't work out. You know, you're flabby. You're not in shape. Uh, and that indicates uh, softness. Uh, and that, of course, is a feminine quality. Um, he says, your hair is too long. Again, a feminine quality. And he says, your skin is pale. Um, which is also in the Greek world, um, a feminine quality. Why is pale skin a feminine quality? Um, because women, respectable women, uh, lived most of their lives indoors. Um, and so pale skin was an, it was an indicator, it wasn't, wasn't just a gender indicator, it was also a class indicator. Uh, if you had pale skin, it meant your husband was wealthy because it meant that you as the wife didn't have to leave the house. Um, you didn't have to work outdoors, you didn't have to do lab physical labor um, the way that uh, poor people had to do it, uh, both male and female outside. So so there's the kind of like, there's the um, uh, a lack of muscle tone, there's the long hair, and there's the pale skin, uh, all of which uh, bother Pentheus because uh, he, I guess, wasn't expecting to see um, a guy, a, 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 sorry, a dude, a dude looks like a lady. Um, and, th and that's the point here with Dionysus. That's what really gets under, sorry, pardon the pun, um, Pentheus' skin is that Dionysus has uh, what we call an androgynous look. So the andro part of this word is the Greek word for a man, and the gune part, as in like gynecology, that's the Greek word for woman. So uh, Dionysus looks like both a man and a woman, which is to say he has an androgynous appearance. And this bothers Pentheus, because Pentheus has very strict ideas about what is right and what is wrong what is masculine and what is feminine. He's got these very narrow, uh, very uh, culturally conservative, this very culturally conservative value set that he tries to put everything into boxes into. So because Dionysus doesn't uh, fit into a box, uh, it bothers uh, Pentheus. Uh, but I think the thing that bothers Pentheus more than anything else is the fact that Dionysus, as part of his androgynous look, he doesn't have a beard, okay? So beards are important um, in ancient Greek iconography. Uh, generally, what they what they tend to symbolize is your full manhood, your full your full adulthood, um, uh, coming into the kind of full masculinity, masculinitiness of your masculinity. Um, I don't know exactly how to put it, uh, but yeah, I mean it, it's supposed to be a, a symbol of uh, full manhood. Um, and so uh, uh, Pe uh, Dionysus does not have a beard, but here's the thing, neither does Pentheus. Pentheus hasn't been, he's too young. He's, he's, he's only 18, 19, 20 years old. So he, he just has like peach fuzz, you know, a little scraggly little beard, you know. Um, as my, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, I have another joke. I won't tell it. I promise. Um, the so the the um, uh, so the, this is. That's what happens when you don't wear gloves outside. Um, so the the beardlessness of Dionysus is, I think, bothersome to Pentheus because. Well, and let's all chew. Let's not forget they're cousins, 
All right, so they're very closely related. So there's probably, we can probably imagine a family resemblance between the two of them. Um, even if Pentheus probably is, you know, uh, you know, got the, you know, I don't even know what the slang phrase is, but he's got the jacked up muscles and, uh, you know, works out all the time. And Dionysus is kind of like slobby and, um, you know, looks more like a couch potato. Uh, uh, but I, I think that there is a recognition uh, that happens between Pentheus and Dionysus. And I, so I think that when Pentheus looks at Dionysus, I think he can't help but see a little bit of himself in Dionysus. And, and that bothers him, that because he doesn't like what he's looking at, right? Doesn't like the man in the mirror, so to speak. Um, and he doesn't like his effeminacy. He doesn't like his long hair. He doesn't like his pale skin. He doesn't like the fact that he doesn't have a beard. Even though Pentheus himself doesn't have a beard, he's probably very deeply insecure about that um, because he lacks that, you know, principal icon of, of masculinity, masculine authority in, in having a beard. Uh, so it bothers him. And they have their agon scene. They have their back and forth. There are many interesting things that are said between the two of them. Uh, lots of uh, good insults, uh, lots of sick burns that happen in the argument between Pentheus and Dionysus. One of the joys of reading Euripides is the fact that he took uh, um, aspects of comedy and mixed them into his, the, the construction of tragedy. So there are actually some things that are, are quite hilarious uh, in Euripides in a way that there really aren't. Um, there are things that are funny in Aeschylus and Sophocles, but there, there are never any ha-ha funny things. There are only jokes that you get if you know where to look for the jokes, um, ironies and that kind of thing. Uh, but in Euripides, there are actually a few kind of laugh out loud moments. I'll come to one of those in just a moment. Um, but as it turns out, of course, uh, Pentheus can't, uh, in the end, he can't abide the threat of Dionysus um, in his city, and I think also uh, uh, to a greater extent he can't abide the threat of Dionysus to his own personal identity. Um, he physically assaults him, he cuts his hair off, imagine you're arguing with somebody and they cut your hair, I mean, come on. That's a, By the way, that's a symbolic rape, that's Pentheus symbolically raping Dionysus, that's him imposing his masculine will over what he uh, uh, deems to be uh, the inherent uh, femininity of Dionysus. So I know it's buried deep in the text, but that's that's what it is. Um, uh, what else did I want to talk about? They go through these ideas about uh, who is foolish and who is wise, who is blind and who can see. I got this. I'm, I got this all messed up. I'm gonna. Ha I'm gonna have to rewrite all of this. But I'll leave it here now, just so I remember. Um, uh, damn it! <laughs> this would be easier if I had a chalkboard. Um, there is at one point where uh, uh, um, Pentheus asks. Dionysus, uh, well, if di this di if this Dionysus, because remember, again, I want to reemphasize this, Pentheus doesn't know that he's talking actually to Dionysus. He thinks that this is just a priest of Dionysus. So he says to whom he believes to be a priest of Dionysus, um, uh, uh, so this Dionysus that you talk about, uh, I never heard of him. Where is he worshipped? To which uh, the priest, which is to say Dionysus, replies, well, foreigners, foreigners everywhere celebrate the rites of Dionysus. Pentheus' response? They're stupider than the Greeks are. Yeah, I actually uses the word moron, where we get our English word moron from. Uh, they're 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 less educated. They don't know they don't know any better, uh, but we Greeks know better because uh, we're more enlightened than the stupid 
dirty foreigners. Um, um, and that's a, that's a pretty key line in the text um, because that drives at, uh, um, I'm now, I'm going to rewrite this thing or start at least making notes towards rewriting this thing. Um, that's, that's one of the things that uh, forms the central uh, thematic dialogue within the play itself. It's a dialogue between what it means to be Greek, i.e. what Greekness is, and what it means to be foreign. So when we talk about this idea of foreign, there's two words here. Yes, you're getting more Greek words. Too bad. One of them you already know. That word is xenos. We had this in, context, in the context of Homer. Um, we talked about it there, meaning the guest or the host uh, or a stranger. Um, but it can also mean a foreigner, but what it means is a foreigner who is a, um, whose first language is Greek. So it's a Greek-speaking foreigner. So if you're an Athenian and you go to Corinth, um, you're a Xenos. And because you're recognizably Greek, uh, the modes of hospitality are open to you. Um, and, you know, free access to temples and worship and, you know, that, everything except voting, uh, that, that, that kind of thing. Okay, so that's the Greek-speaking foreigner. But then they had another word for the other kind of foreigner. This kind of foreigner is the foreigner who is not a native Greek speaker. This foreigner is called a barbaros. You'll see, uh, obviously, the, the root of our English word barbarian. Uh, in this word, barbaros. So the barbaros is the non-Greek speaking foreigner. So when the Xenos comes, you know, they're okay. When the barbaros comes, they're not okay. The Xenos gets rights to hospitality and other um, civic uh, uh, facilities, etc. Whereas the barbaros, unless they're, a, a, you know, official, you know, government envoy or something of that nature, um, are generally viewed with suspicion. Uh, um, you know, because <clears throat> we're so much more enlightened about foreigners in America today than Greeks were uh, back then. But in any case, uh, the word barbaros is, it's a, it's a funny word. Uh, it it, it um, comes from the, there's a verb, uh, barbarizdo, barbarizdo, right? And what barbarizdo means to speak and, uh, and when you speak, that all of your words sound like this. Bar, 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 bar. Uh, and that's what the Greeks thought all non-Greek languages sounded like. People just go bar, 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 bar. Yes, true story. That is actually the root of that word. Um, and... Uh, uh, yeah, so the Barbaros is the non-Greek speaking Greek, and so the what the 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 uh, the back a represent are these barbarian women. Uh, they're not natively Greek, which so strike one, um, strike one, they're women. Strike two, they're outside celebrating, and strike three, they're not even Greek to begin with. So they they can't win. There's no way they can win. Uh, in, in, in Pentheus's eyes um, in this situation. Okay. So anyway, uh, Pentheus ends up locking up Dionysus again, locking him, in his, locking him back in the jail. When Pentheus is locked in the jail, uh, the chorus comes on. They sing a song. They sing an ode. And in their ode, what they tell us about are a series of illusions that Dionysus shows to Pentheus while he's locked up in jail. He makes Pentheus first think that he's a bull. Um, he secondly makes Pentheus think that he's chaining him up, when in fact it's just a phantom image of uh, Dionysus. And then thirdly, he makes Pentheus think that the palace is on fire. So Pentheus runs around throwing buckets of water all over everything. So another layer of illusion. Sorry, I put the word character there. I'm just going to cross this out real quick because I don't want you to... Uh, be confused. What I'm what I'm dealing with in this chart 
uh, is, uh, well, I mean, I could have left character up there because what is character? It's a mask, so it's an illusion in and of itself. But what I'm dealing with here are the levels of illusion within the plays. And you can begin to see, we're not done here yet, uh, but you can begin to see how this play is built layer upon layer upon layer of illusion, right? So uh, the uh, metaphor that uh, I, I, I think about this are the uh, Russian Kachina dolls, right? All right, let me get one. Okay, so this one's not Russian. Uh, I got this. This one's from uh, Pittsburgh, so it actually might be Russian. Uh, probably more likely to be uh, uh, Croat or, or Polish. Uh, but this is a. This is a. This is. Uh, uh, if you don't recognize him, uh, he is Mario Lemieux, greatest player ever to play hockey. Um, and so. You know, you take the top off. So, so we start with this idea of like, okay, so we're going into the theater. So we're entering into the realm of illusion, right? So we're in the realm of illusion, right? And then when we get into the realm of illusion, we find out that Dionysus is play acting as somebody else. So that's another level of illusion. And then within that illusion, we find out that there are multiple stories uh, for Dionysus's birth. So that's yet another inner illusion. Now, my, oh wait, I got one more here. Um, and then uh, as we um, uh, 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 continue to work through the play, we see that Dionysus performs a series of illusions to trick Pentheus, right? So that's another level of illusion. And now I'm all the way at the inside. And now I gotta put it back together again. <laughs> okay, good. All right. Um, where was I? Oh, I was talking about illusion and Dionysus and Pentheus. So Dionysus shows Pentheus a series of illusions while he's in the jail, which drives Pentheus nuts. In the end, the final uh, and greatest illusion that Dionysus performs on Pentheus himself, personally, though there's another one to come that he performs on Pentheus' mother, is that he then makes Pentheus, he then convinces Pentheus that Pentheus has to dress up like a girl to go and worship Dionysus. Because Pentheus comes out and says, Oh, well, you know, he decides that, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to take my army, I'm going to march up, and I'm going to bring everyone back by force, and, and Dionysus stops him. He says, wait, don't you want to, you know, hey, okay, it's all right, you're the king, you're the man, uh, but wouldn't you like to um, just kind of, like, check out what they're doing, you know, before you arrest all of them? Because remember what Pentheus thinks is these women are getting drunk and having orgies. These women include his mother and both of his two of his aunts. Uh, so Dionysus basically says, Do you, sure you don't want to just like check it out real quick? And then, then you could take your army up and arrest them all. Pentheus says, well, I don't know about all of that. It would be it would be shameful for me to look on these uh, proceedings. And Dionysus says, mm, but still, but still, wouldn't you just kind of like to see, just see it? And Pentheus, at this point, this is this is you, in the text. Um, sorry to use a fishing metaphor, but in a text you can almost feel the hook go into Pentheus's mouth at this point, right? Because Pentheus then says, "I guess I could just hide behind the trees and just kind of like peek out at them a little bit and see what's going on." Right, it's over now. The hook is in. Uh, so Dionysus tells Pentheus that what he has to do uh, in order to see them 
to go up to the mountainside to see them is that he has to dress up as a woman so that they think he's a woman, right? Okay, so here we go again. This is another level of illusion. It's yet another level of illusion. Cadmus and Pentheus did not have to dress up as women to go and join the, 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 the uh, celebrations of Dionysus. So this is Dionysus lying to Pentheus. So again, it's another illusion. Um, uh, and so Pentheus goes into the palace and in what is, uh, I, I mean, I guess I suppose I would put it forward as the probably single funniest scene in Greek tragedy, uh, which seems like a, an odd uh, construction, an odd phrase to say, but it is probably the funniest scene in Greek tragedy. Uh, when Pentheus comes out of the palace dressed in his mom's clothes, right? And so he does the whole, he's all campy about it, puts a wig on. Does my hair, is my hair nice? You know, does my dress look good? Does my butt look big in this? How my, how my ankles, you know, do I, don't I look like my mom in this dress? So it's a very campy scene, right? And so this is all part of Dionysus' revenge. Remember, Pentheus was the man's man. He was Mr. Masculinity. Right? So part of Pentheus' revenge is to turn him into something much more effeminate. Um, to, to, yeah, right. To uh, humble him in that respect. Uh, so they go up to the mountainside. Uh, they, walk, they see what's going on. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the women are not having orgies. Um, um, uh, I'm, trying, I, I'm trying to limit this to... Um, there's a lot of things I'm going to talk about with respect to this play, um, and, but I'm trying to keep it to a minimum. Um, uh, and they're not having orgies, uh, but uh, what happens is that uh, Dionysus, because uh, he's a god, because he can do this, bends a tree down and puts Pentheus on top of it so that Pentheus can see out over everything. And then Dionysus turns around to all the women and says, hey, look up there. And they all look up there and they all think they see at the top of the tree a lion cub. Of course, it's not a lion cub, it's Pentheus. So, whoa, wait, what's that? Going down the, going down the illusion hole another step here, right? It's not really a lion cub, it's actually Pentheus, but they all think it's a lion cub, so they shake the tree. Um, they actually eventually take, take the tree out of the ground, and Pentheus falls out, of course, and then they all attack Pentheus, and they tear him apart, limb from limb. Okay, I am going to talk about this just for a moment, because this is kind of cool, um, in a really gruesome sense. Um, this is a, a, a reference to what people said was a ritual for Dion, Dionysus. It's called sparagmos. Now, we aren't 100% sure that this ritual actually was ever performed. Um, but the rumor was that the, uh, the, the devotees of Dionysus, which is to say the initiates, into the mystery cult of Dionysus. So when we deal with Dionysus, we're talking about the mystery cult, which means that you had to be initiated. You had to learn things and then and then go through rituals and then you were initiated and you weren't allowed to talk about anything that you learned in your initiation. It wasn't so far off from like a fraternity or sorority the way that they operate now. Um, uh, yeah, but you, I mean, you were initiated into it. So the Dionysus mystery cult, supposedly, the rumor was that they practiced this ritual called sparagmos. And what sparagmos was, uh, was when they took a wild animal and ripped it apart as it was still alive and ate it raw. Um, there are obvious reasons why uh, modern scholars doubt the veracity. Uh, of this, uh, I think uh, first and foremost is uh, food poisoning, <laughs> for <laughs> for one thing. Um, uh, 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 but it it does it, the reason why this myth was told about Dionysus is because part of Dionysus's birth myth is that he was found 
uh, by the Titans. Remember, the Titans are the enemies of the Olympian gods, and they ripped him up and, uh, in an attempt to kill him, but Zeus saved him and put him back together again, brought him back to life. So it is related back into the myth, whether the ri well, ritual, ritual always precedes the myth. The rituals are always there before the myths are made up uh, ab ab about them. I know that seems, uh, or can seem sort of counterintuitive. You would think that the myth would be there and then we modeled the rituals on the myth. But what we find when we look at the actual evidence is that the rituals pre-existed the myths. The myths were invented to explain the rituals. The rituals weren't invented to explain the myths. Um, so anyway, I, that, yeah, I didn't mean to, I told you I wasn't going to talk about stuff that wasn't relevant. And I did. Uh, it is relevant. Uh, <clears throat> so they shake Pentheus down, they rip them out of the tree limb from limb, and uh, they tear them apart. And uh, it's uh, Agave, who is uh, Pentheus's mom, she takes the head, uh, which again, remember, at this point she thinks it's still... Uh, a lion cub, and she takes the head and she sticks it on the end of her thyrsus. Right? Sticks it down. So instead of this uh, crown of ivy leaves, is her son's head. Though she doesn't yet know it's her, it's her son's head. And she carries it back to the city, boasting all the way about how proud her son is going to be when he sees her. Why, why does she think Pentheus will be proud of her? Because she's done a man's job. She's hunted, right? That's a masculine endeavor. So, so she, so, and she knows that her son, what her son values are, you know, the masculine qualities of it. Um, of course, uh, uh, it, it's his head and Cadmus, uh, her dad, Pentheus' grandfather sees the head and kind of how, does the how many fingers do I have up kind of routine, talks her back to her senses. And uh, she eventually, of course, realizes that it is, uh, she's killed her son. Okay, so there's the tragedy part of tragedy. Then Dionysus comes, reappears, this time not as the priest, but rather as himself as the god Dionysus, um, and reveals himself to uh, establish his place of worship in Thebes, and to explain everything that's happened, and to hand out some punishments. So who does he hand out punishments to? In particular, he, he hands them out to Cadmus. Uh, I'm, I'll just talk about Cadmus and Cadmus's punishment, because... Dionysus uh, sends Cadmus and his wife, her name is Harmonia, as in like Harmony, Harmonia, uh, into exile. Why? What did they do wrong? Well, if you think back to the start of the play, so we're missing a chunk of the play, and the chunk of the play that we're missing actually is most of, uh, mostly Dionysus' speech, where probably he explained uh, the different punishments. Um, but I think with the punishment, so we're left with this question of why is Cadmus punished? Uh, what did he do wrong? Um, when, you, when you go back to the start of the play, you think of Cadmus. Remember Cadmus, when, when he was telling Pentheus to accept Dionysus' worship into the city, remember what he told him the reason was. He told him the reason was it doesn't matter if he's a god or not. Who cares? It only matters that people think that we have a god in the family. So it seems to me, to my reading at any rate, and again, not obligated to, 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 to read it this way, you can find your own evidence in the text and make your own arguments, um, is that Cadmus is punished because he has a rationalized belief. He's not, he's not, he doesn't really believe in Dionysus as a god, uh, but it looks good for the family if people think that there's a god in the family. So. That's my theory. Anyway, they have a happy ending. They want they get turned into snakes, Cadmus and Harmonia, and they wander around. They slither around for a while, and then they come back, and then they're turned back into humans, and eventually are made into demigods. So you know, okay, I guess I would spend a few years as a snake if I if I knew I was going to be made immortal at the end of at the end of it. Um, so not all that bad. Um, yeah, 
Um, so there's just two, a couple of things that I, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about here that I'm going to wrap up on. Um, I want to come back here to talk about the Thyrsus, the symbol of the worship of Dionysus. Uh, why is it a symbol of the worship of Dionysus? Because it's a fertility symbol, which is to say its design is meant to suggest the male reproductive member. It's a phallus. Looks like an erect penis. Or at least that's what it's supposed to suggest. Okay, so two things. On the one hand, this ties into uh, uh, Dionysus and his associations with fertility. But there's another joke here too. Um, I said I, 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 I said I thought the the cross-dressing scene uh, was the funniest um, in Greek tragedy. Actually, I actually think this is a kind of a sort of a funnier joke, although it's not. The cross-dressing scene is funny because it's it's all it's all campy and it's um, verbal and and uh, and slapsticky. Um, and it's very reminiscent of comedy um, as opposed to tragedy. This other joke that is embedded uh, somewhat slightly deeper in the text um, is uh, something that takes thinking about. So bear with me here. Now, it's going to sound like I'm being crude, but I'm not being crude. I'm just explaining the joke as it goes. Okay. So the thesis here, right, this is suggestive of the phallus. In other words, it's a fertility symbol um, supposed to evoke notions of, you know, masculine potency or whatnot, uh, or not, or whatnot. Yes, masculine potency, basically. So when Gave, she when she kills her son, Pentheus, right? Remember, Pentheus is Mr. Masculine, right? Can't deal with, with uh, any of these threats of effeminacy uh, undermining the order of his city. Uh, because women should be indoors, and if they're not observed and closely regulated, then things dissolve into chaos. Uh, that's his kind of attitude. Um, when Agave takes her son's head and, and, and puts it on top of the thyrsus, sticks it down right on top of the thyrsus, the joke here is, of course, Pentheus is a dickhead. That's... That's actually the joke. That's literally the joke. And and, and uh, Euripides meant you to get that. Uh, that this guy who set himself up as the, um, you know, arbiter, the, 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 the prime judge of rightness and wrongness based on traditional um, ideas of masculinity, he himself has been turned into the visual image uh, of a dick. Okay, so last thing I'm going to talk about here uh, are the larger themes uh, of Oedipus the King. Now, I wrote these already, but I wrote them out in the wrong order, so I'm going to have to recopy some of them. I'll, keep, I'll stick to the main ones. While also trying to write legibly. Feel free to uh, put on your iTunes for a moment. All right, I'm just going to stick to the, I could go on with this list. I could run this list to like 10, 12, 15 different things, I'll, but I'll just stick to this right now. Um, 
I'm gonna what what this list uh, is illustrative of, illustrative of, which I hope it's illustrative of. Uh, what I intend it to be illustrative of are um, what I refer to as dualisms uh, in the back A, where Euripides is um, um, directly engaging with and in many instances directly challenging uh, traditional beliefs of the Athenians and of larger Greek culture in general. What, I'm, what do I mean by that? Well, okay, so I'll just here's the list, right? So we have a bunch of these dichotomies, or as I have called them, dualisms. Uh, I write it because I don't want you guys. Somebody's going to complain. I'll do it later. Because they're such a pain in my ass. So these are these are the basic dualisms uh, within the within the play, right? Um, these are only some of them. There are many, many more that I could go through, but these are the these are the kind of ones that are are, are the main ones. Okay, we'll leave it up there for a second. I'll talk about each of these um, in exchange. Obviously, the biggest one, the major one, is the is the dualism between Greek and foreign. Greeks are intelligent. Greeks have self control. Greeks worship the real God. Foreigners, the Barbaros, they're not intelligent. They, they, they lack self-control. They're lazy. Or they're violent, but never in the middle. And they worship all the wrong gods. So, to a, the traditional Greek mind, Greekness is better than foreignness. Oh, yeah. Greek, uh, you know, Cultural chauvinism is is all it is. Um, quite sure I don't need to explain this uh, too much because uh, most of you uh, will at this stage in your life have some experience with American uh, cultural chauvinism. Um, so it's just a different context, but it operates in the same way. Uh, so Greekness better than foreignness. Likewise, it's better to be a man than it is to be a woman. Men are by nature, they are rational. Uh, and, and uh, uh, well, yeah, they're rational, intelligent. They do the political, and as such, they do all the political affairs. They, 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 they're the ones who run the city uh, um, or the community. Uh, whereas women have to be controlled because if you can't, they're not rational. And you can't leave them on their own. There's a whole bunch of reasons for this. I won't get into it right now. These are deep-seated. Um, they, they predate the Greeks, certainly. Uh, people have been uh, sexist for a very long time. Um, so then you come to these two terms. So this is sophrosune over here on the right. This word means self-control. I should have given you, I now realize I did not give you this term uh, with Oedipus the king. I ought to have, uh, because this is this is the central concept associated with the god Apollo, of all gods, not Dionysus. So Sophrosune means self-control. It's sometimes uh, translated as moderation. It's sometimes translated as temperance. We don't really use those words much anymore in English, so we'll just use the word self-control here. And it's, an, it's inherently a masculine quality and inherently not a female quality. Its opposite is this word over here, akolasia. Acolasia, sorry for the awkward notes, but you can see where the arrow goes. Acolasia means self-indulgence. So they're opposite concepts. Sophrosune means self-control. That means knowing your boundaries, knowing who you are, knowing your limits uh, within your community, but also knowing your limits uh, as a human being 
within the cosmos itself. Akolasia is acting without any sort, any sense of restraint. So it is the opposite of Sofrasuni. Uh, and then, of course, I mean, I put wise and foolish on here. That, that's just one, another thing uh, that comes up in the course of the play. Tiresias to Pentheus, you're a fool because you don't worship him. Pentheus to Tiresias, no, you're a fool because, look, you're old and you're dressed up like you're a young, uh, young maenad. Um, oh, wait, okay, so we, we need one more thing that I want to talk about here. I'm give you one more dualism, which is... The difference between sane and insane, right? Sane and crazy. So here we come back to Dionysus and the back A. So I'm gonna start back, I'm gonna come back here to where I began the lecture with. Okay, I'm gonna talk a little I'm gonna talk for a second about Bacchus's names, and then I'm gonna wrap up. I swear, I promise you. So Bacchus, this name, which the Romans uh this will become the, the most, it's a Greek word, but the, this is the name the Romans will prefer. So he's often more free. It's often uh, 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 more commonly known as Bacchus. But anyway, this, this name more closely associates with his uh, attributes of wine. Uh, Bromius more closely associates with his attributes of fertility. Bromius means uh, the one who roars like a bull. Bromao, to roar like a bull. So the play is called the Bacchae because the chorus are the worshippers of, of, of Bacchus. So the Bacchae, Bacantes. Um, but you will have noticed in the text that they are also uh, frequently referred to as the Maenads. They're called the main ads. Well, this word means crazy women. That's literally what it means. Um, it is uh, uh, etymologically related, related to your English word mania. So the possession of Dionysus is like being drunk. It's like being crazy. It's like seeing visions and all that stuff. So let me wrap up here. Let me come back here to this, to my dualisms. If you see what, what Euripides does throughout the course of this play, so you see with all these dualisms, I put the slash between them, right? So this slash that goes between all of them, right? Which we think of as like a hard dividing line, right? One thing, it, can't, it can be this thing or it can be that thing, but it can't be both things at the same time. What Euripides does in this play is he takes all of these slashes and he just blurs. He blurs all the lines between them, right? So the priest who comes back is a Greek, but he's also a foreigner. He's masculine, but he's also feminine, right? The women are thought to be behaving in ways that are out of control, but in fact, when we see them, they are very controlled within, within themselves. So, like I said, I could have ran this list to, well, see, I did run it to many other terms, but I won't, uh, I won't do that now. Um, and that's the joy of Euripides, uh, and that's what makes him different uh, from Sophocles and from Aeschylus, uh, in that Euripides uh, frequently challenged um, accepted cultural notions. Uh, and he paid the price for it. He wasn't uh, as popular as other playwrights were. Um, doesn't surprise me. Um, it's hard to be. It's hard to challenge people's uh, received uh, conceptions and still be popular. Um, so uh, yeah, there's that. Anyway, I guess I'm done talking about Euripides. Uh, well, I can't remember what I'm the next lecture is. Let me look it up here. I think it's probably Plato. Indeed, it is Plato. Uh, I will be doing Plato uh, for Wednesday. So uh, see you then, and everybody be safe and uh, be nice to each other. Okay, bye.